Good day to you. Uh, my name is Tony Ballinger from the Fighting Men of Rhodesia YouTube series. Today we have a guest speaker, Kurs Kotzer from South Africa. Um, he runs the Legacy Conversations uh, YouTube channel, which is very similar to ours, where South African personnel talk about the experiences in the South African Defence Force. And I recently sent um, an ad advertisement to his channel asking for any South Africans who fought in the Rhodesian War uh, to please come forward and give their stories to Fighting Men of Rhodesia. And um, he very kindly agreed to that, and it will be appearing soon on Legacy Conversations. So um, hopefully we'll hear some more interesting stories from South African men who fought in our army, or women. Um, and um, he's sent uh, a reciprocal video, which you're about to see. Um, he has a, a great fondness for the Rhodesian people, um, he respects us a lot, respects our armed forces a lot, and um, so this is a video from him just telling us about um, his interaction with us, his travels up into to Rhodesia, as it was back in those days. And um, so uh, have a look at it, and um, if you would still like to do a talk of your own, please don't forget to contact me in the link below, um, as John will set that up for you to have a look at. So, over to course. Hello everyone. I want to thank uh, Tony Ballinger and the rest of the fighting men of Rhodesia to uh, afford me this chance to speak to you. My name is Chris Kotsa. I'm a creator of Legacy Conversations, which is a very similar thing than fighting men. Uh, we just look more into the SADF. SAP is South African orientated, but we do have a guest playlist uh, where mostly Rhodesians are featured uh, simply because I like Rhodesians and I have a history with Rhodesians. And besides that, I also uh, think that the two wars were really interlinked. And then it is so that a lot of South Africans actually fought for Rhodesia. And a lot of the SADF members were there, a lot of uh, Air Force. And of course, my own, my background is one of the South African police force. Uh, we we learned the tricks of trade in Rhodesia, and we're very grateful for that. I always felt that there was a relationship between the two countries, which is enduring to this very day. And I felt that I should come on to Fighting Men and ask all of you if you want to record your stories for the sake of history. Uh, when you're welcome at Legacy Conversations, we will definitely allow you. We do things a bit differently, I understand. Um, we let people speak as long as they please. Uh, I, I don't really care whether the man speaks an hour or two hours or 15 hours. It doesn't matter to me. It's only limited by uh, what our computers can actually uh, render in terms of editing. And that's about two and a half, three hours. But we have five hours uh, episodes as well. Now, some people will say that's insanity. People don't have time to look. Uh, actually, they do. And they can always press the pause button. Funny thing with legacy is a lot of people say to me, they don't actually watch the videos, they, they listen to it. Meaning they would be in a car somewhere or a truck and they're driving and uh, and then they just listen to to a show and it, it's fantastic uh, to hear such stories. Uh, one fellow actually uh, called me and he said he drove right across the state of Victoria or something in, in Australia, listening to, to the different playlists. Well, when he reached the other side of where he was going, he was about a wife. <laughs> for which I apologize, but um, this definitely seems to me a big, big interest in, in the South African part of the war. I think uh, I think the lads were never allowed to speak. You know, everything they did was basically secret. And besides that, we, the war was far away from South Africa. Yes, there were vicious battles going on in the, in the black townships. There were, there were fights on the South African borders as well. There was... Uh, a counter-terrorism thing going on inside the country, but the average troop had no idea about that and had no clue that that was happening, and the average, average citizen had even less. Uh, so, so when you came back from the borders and from from wherever you where you went, no one was that interested in hearing your story. I mean, people were just not not that interested, and so so the men kept quiet. And then, then came legacy, and then people suddenly started talking. And it's amazing what we find out. I mean, it is just amazing. Because there's simply no way with a war that went on that that long, that complex, that uh, you can know everything yourself. I mean, you might know a little bit of the, of the theater you were in at a certain time. 
Uh, and then uh, you know nothing else. You don't know we're sitting on a on a copy there on the other side or the armored guys, armor formations moving on the other side or wherever. You didn't know. Uh, you were just a little small pawn in a very, very big picture. And and so I think Legacy is opening a lot of, of interesting and new views. Um, but let me tell you a brief, uh, briefly about myself. Uh, I was born in Fijelikang, would you believe? Uh, my parents were very good people, staunch of recaller, Christian type of people, even though my father is, is, was actually Jewish. If not in faith, definitely his mom was Jewish, so it makes him, you know. And uh, there were a fair amount of discrimination against him because of that. So he ended up as a, as a regional magistrate, and we did all the terrorism cases. I would say the cases which most of the other people were a bit scared of. Uh, brilliant legal mind. Uh, he was uh, left the school at the age of 15. I was already matriculated, jumped, jumped standards. And then he uh, worked on his father's asbestos mine, uh, which was on a family farm in the Northern Cape. And that could that, that, that killed him in later years at the age of 57. He died because of uh, asbestosis, because of that one year which he spent inside the mines working. Uh, you see, I had to get the time passed to, to become 16 years old to join the state service. And by the age of 18, he was already an acting uh, magistrate. Uh, so uh, we were traveling quite a lot. We were, we were moved around really a lot. Uh, I was in, <laughs> I think, 10 or 14 schools, man. I was in a lot of schools. Uh, as as my father was, was promoted and transferred around. But in the middle 1970s, we ended up in uh, Katima Molilo, which, you know, is not that far away from Big Falls, I think, because we, we drove right through Rhodesia to actually get to, to Katima. Why my dad took that route, I don't know. Uh, but he did. And I, I will never forget when we crossed the border, there were the Rhodesian army, might have been police, I don't know. I was about 10 years old then. So it must have been 60, sorry, 77, around about there. Uh, 76, perhaps. Uh, and then we were driving in, in convoys. And I remember the Rhodesian worm. He spoke the mixture of English and uh, Afrikaans, which impressed the hell out of me. Uh, what, what impressed me even more is this guy's the way they looked, you know, they had this camo uniform which I found a lot more sexy than the uh, rounds of the of army. I hope I'm not, I'm not shot by someone for saying that, but that was one of the major reasons I actually went to a South African police force. I liked the camo, man. It was just, to me, a bit more sexy. And uh, they really looked like fighting me. They, they were hot, they were tough, they were in shape. Um, they knew what they were doing. I, I think for them it was quite boring, actually, <laughs> thinking back now. But but for me, it was impre I was impressed with these people, and uh, they were very professional. In fact, uh, that, that commander of a convoy reminded me very much of a, of a South African Air Force pilot, uh, because from Katima we would fly to Waterkloof every now and then in the Dakotas and the C-130, C-160s, uh, which was one hell of an experience for, for a young boy, uh, interested in military affairs, of course. And so uh, same type of briefing. We're going to drive like this, you're going to keep your distance, you're going to do that. If you break down, if you do this, if you do that. Man, it was just fantastic. We, we, we felt safe. And uh, it was a different country. And if I look at the pictures we took while we were driving these little Kodak cameras, uh, I do realize it must have been in a rainy season. It was a fantastically beautiful country. It was, man, it was green and there were a lot of wildlife. And, and we were just motoring. My, my dad, I think, had a valiant. And I don't think the old valiant ever went that quick in his life. You know, we are rustic and so normally. So anyway, we got, we got there. And at one stage, we were in Salisbury also. And the first time I saw the television set in the, in the bedroom. And we had no television in South Africa at that stage. Yes, they were bringing it in slowly. But, I mean, by the time we got back to South Africa in about 1980, around right about there, we were at 79, not too sure. Um, television was there. And we bought a big color TV, TV set. Uh, but for us, this was brand new. And I remember my dad calling us children together, all four of us, and says, uh, this is the future. And see this, see this is the future. And I thought to myself, oh, what a country. You know, it, it just looks to me like this place is advanced. Because at that stage, I've been reading uh, A.J. Fenter's books. And he was writing, you know, the Portuguese uh, wars going on as well as the Rhodesian one. And uh, I had a totally different idea of view on, on what was happening and what I saw in the reality. It was totally different. It didn't look like a war zone at that stage. But you could see there is something going on, definitely, when you moved in the rural areas. And that, that is how I got introduced to the Rhodesians. And then, of course, in 1980, when the changes came, 81, we were back in South Africa living in a place called King Williamstown. 
and uh, that's in the Eastern Cape, and there were a lot of uh, Rhodesians arriving south, and they were they were wonderful people, you know, very English, but they were they were wonderful people. They they were kind and they were experienced, and they were like there was a sadness about it. And uh, they said to me, I mean, I was listening to the grown ups talking, and, and they said that you, you people have ten years. And I thought to myself, man, you, it's not for me to argue with a grown up, but um, I, I think South Africa is a massively powerful country uh, for the region. And we can mobilize hundreds of thousands of people, a powerful air force, navy, everything, army, even the police, 120,000 policemen, many, many of them trained in, in uh, counter insurgency. I thought, no, we, we, we can we can fight this. But as you know, your people were actually quite correct. And then another five or six years went past, and now I'm a young police constable there at King Williamstown. I say it's a lot damn place I wanted to be. I asked to be transferred to Messina or Winterk or anywhere except that place. And of course, His Excellency, the police commissioner, um, I have a sense of humor uh, with these, these, these old generals, you know. It's just never a nice sense of humor for you on the ground. But anyway, they, they, they transferred me back to a really where I don't want to be. And then I think in 87, Paul Al broke loose. Because the Transkai Special Forces on the, I think, Rhodesian Command attacked Sebe. President Sebe and Bishop, which is right next to King William Stone, is 10 kilos at the most. And of course, we were, we were on duty that night and we heard uh, the gunshots and gunfire. And so we drove off to go and see what happened. One constable it later said he just saw the tracer running there across and he got out of it. Um, I think we were shooting a few shots that way, a few shots that way to declare neutrality and then we sort of pissed off back to, back to uh, King Williamstown. And the next morning, it was all hell is breaking loose now. You have to understand, now we're hunting these uh, terrorist trans guys, special forces guys. And the next morning, I'm driving to East London because I had to report something at the district commissioner, I think. I was driving in my civilian car, an old red um, Corolla. And as I was driving, the next moment I see this, this special forces team crossing the, the double highway. It's a double highway like this, for those who don't know. And I'm going towards East London, and it's there just before you eat Bright Park. So it's not far from King Grimstown. So they obviously made their, their way back, and they were going somewhere, and they crossed the... Uh, they crossed the, the highway in front of me and behind me because I, I kept going. And so I could see that these people were not normal. Their weapons weren't normal. They weren't normal. And that wasn't the worst because I was still watching this. In the next moment, here comes a South African Air Force a helicopter came in camera and it landed and these people got onto it and, it, and they left. And I knew at that stage, 19 years old, I knew our government in Pretoria is playing flipping games with us here because we could have been killed. And I would not blame these people if they started shooting at us as well. I mean, we were hunting them. In fact, when I got back, the police had an entire tracking team together there. And now we're in our blue uniforms in the bush. And I thought to myself, man, we're going to die today. And, and you know what? We picked up weapons and... Um, uh, and grenades and things after the raid uh, for months afterwards. In fact, two little Victorines died because they picked up some hand grenades, pulled the pin, and they just blew them. They blew off of their face out. I will always remember you could see the teeth, perfectly formed teeth, but they were no face, and of course they bled to death. And the weapons which we collected and magazines and things were all our fives, which again, mean to me that it's not real terrorists. There's something else happening here. So anyway, that's a story with the Rhodesians, and I want to thank those involved that day, but they didn't shoot me. Highly professional people, I was, I was quite impressed. And now I have to jump another five years, six years, because in 92, I started at Coxies at the Free State University. I decided well, I will leave the police force because I could see this, the changes were just not for me. In fact, that, that day on the 2nd of February, when we heard that Mandela would be released, uh, I was up in what we call the Devil's Corner or something like that, Triangle. It's where Rhodesia and Mozambique and Botswana, that, that border there. We were up there and there was a shooting taking place between my section and people on the other side, in Botswana side, actually. And talking about Botswana, we, we often watched the Botswana army moving through, doing sweeping patrols. Uh, they had cover with helicopter gunships. And there were white people in charge of them. So I can just think that the SAS in some way was involved, but they were 
tactically speaking, pathetic. They were moving way too fast. They were noisy. They were they were just not good. Uh, we we spotted them at a long, long distance away, and we could just go down. Uh, but one day, one of the helicopters actually came and just hovered on the other side of the river, and you could see those rocket piles and things. Those pilots looking at you, and you're looking at those pilots. And I thought to myself, well, it says we okay, Coral or something, you know, what, what do you call that movie? <laughs> Uh, but luckily, the helicopter first off. But that's in the first time in my life when I realized how it must feel to to face a gunship or something. It, it cannot be a nice, a nice feeling at all. Uh, but now we go on a little bit later on. I qualified as an attorney, and the only place I can find work is at uh, a place called Ishmal Ayob, which in the old days was known as a terrorist law firm, simply because they had very famous people who we considered to be terrorists in those days as their main clients. So they were human rights law firm, very good one, very famous one in Africa anyway. And the main client since the 1960s was, was one Nelson Mandela. Who was a wonderful chap, let me tell you by the time I met him, and tell you many, many stories about Mr. Mandela. And the rest of them I can tell you a lot of stories too, but they were not that kind. Uh, anyway, at also at that stage in my life, I became involved in uh, what I call counter-terrorism all over Sub-Saharan Africa. I will not and cannot speak about that part of my life, which lasted for many years. But I did write about 53 books on it under a pseudonym called George M. James. And it's an easy name to explain, a pseudonym. It's not really a secret. I mean, those we need to know. Uh, it does know, actually. Um, I, I took my name, Kotze, you know, and I asked to myself in English, what, what, what do you call it? You know, not be not Kotze, it means to throw up. Um, what do you call that in English? And the answer is George, man. You're calling old George. So that's the one way. And then my late wife, Melissa, was in the U.S. Navy. She was an aviator flying. Uh, I think she started with a, with a Tom, Tomcat. No, she started with a Phantom and then the Tomcat and then the Hornet, Super Hornet. And she was flying those things. And she was dual qualified to Rotary as well. So by the time I met her, she was out of the Navy and uh, programming the flight simulators. And I recall saying to her, Melissa, you better report to your people that you've met me and you're in love. Because I'm, you know, from the other side. South Africa is not a friend of the U.S. in any sense of the word. It's a country which changed it, became a BRICS country. I write about that extensively in my books. People are only now waking up to what I <laughs> was telling them. Um, anyway, she, she passed. Uh, my organs started packing up. She, she died. We had to switch the machines off. It's the second time in my life that I stood next to a dead wife, even though I wasn't physically there because I'm banned in every NATO country, including the US. <laughs> Long story that one too, and uh, probably because I was seen with people who I considered to be um, terrorists or something. You know, you don't get a chance to explain yourself. I just, uh, I just put you on one of these silly lists and then you can't get there. And so I couldn't even bury her, uh, which is fine. She was cremated and one day, who knows? Who knows? We will be uh, together again. I, I have to hope. Um, but it was a very sad time in my life. And when I started writing, uh, sorry, when I started writing these books on the George M. James, Jim J. name, I wanted to include Messi. And so I put the M in. So the M, which stands for Melissa. And James, man, if you take my name, Jacobus, and you translate it to English, it's James. So non, I wouldn't say all of those books are fiction. In fact, of M5 doesn't even claim to be fiction. Uh, no, they're not, not fiction at all. Um, they're non-fiction. Uh, they don't claim to be. Uh, but the majority of them, I would say, is fictionalized. In other words, they are based upon operations which which might have happened or not, or training training scenarios, whatever. Uh, the one thing I can tell you about those books is they are technically correct. If I say to you, there's a hill and there's a river and there's a plant and there's a tree and there's a bush, then you can go there and look at it. It will be there. If I say to you that uh, this weapon systems will do this and this, I guarantee you it will do that and that. And the history inside them is, of course, totally, totally true as far as history can be true. Um, because it's always a debate on history, isn't it? That's why fighting men and um, legacy is such such good channels in the sense that we, we record the history, we're giving testimonies. And I like that because, you know, there's a lot of nonsense which were written, especially about the sort of can effort uh, by the liberals, you know, in the 1990s, everyone was a secret communist. You just didn't know about it. Yeah, put the you know, all pieces of, 
you know, I always say to work, you know, what I think of such people. You know, the funny thing is when, when I was working with Mr. Mandela and the people, they fully respected my background and they fully respected the people who stood up and said, we, we fought, the war is over, let's shake hands. They respected that. But they could not honest, uh, understand nor, nor respect these, these heartbreakers, the Chabas. And these Chabas so sadly never realized that. So a whole flood of books came out in the 1990s, which... Uh, actually insulted the uh, honor of the SADF as well as the police, very much so. And so I, when I was 20 years out of the police, I, I said to myself, well, it's time for me to write my memoirs of the police. That's the normal police, and there's nothing special about me, really. Uh, but I wrote my story, and they did very well. I think we were more than 100,000 downloads on, on the Police Mean Streets books. And in them, I also described how I, during my coin training, I had some Rhodesian instructors who came down south. And again, these worms couldn't speak of the cards that well, but they could speak it well enough. And uh, they were wonderful people, you know. They would teach you exactly what the police manual said, and they would say, say, boys, come here, let's stand here around me, and circle me, circle me, and then we would sit there, and, and the woman would explain to us exactly what we should do and should not do. Because the damn problem we had in the SAP coin on the South African borders was uh, there were not a lot of us. Some bases had 10 men. Uh, so you were not operating in huge groups, and the training were in pallet platoon size, and not really operating on section size alone. So these people could train us what to do and what not to do, and I would really listen to these people because you could see experience, man. Experience is, is a wonderful thing. It's it's it's, a, it's it's something you can tap in if you're a young man, and just shut up and listen to the old guys talking. You, you will learn so much. Uh, that's my motto in life, anyway. So, but I was also also asking questions. So I needed to know. And I was lucky in my first first trip, I had an uh, old detective with me uh, because our units were from detectives to dark unit you know, to like myself out of the flying squad and then people like that, you know. Um, we were different backgrounds, very much different backgrounds, which, which made us so, so effective, I actually would say. Uh, but we can talk about that. This is in the Mean Streets books anyway. And um, this guy was in part two, he was policing anti-terrorist unit. He had the little uh, part two badges on his on his camo. He still had the first generation camo, you know, the old camo we used in Rhodesia. And so uh, I really learned a lot from him. I mean, I changed the formation to walking patrol immediately. We changed it. Uh, we changed the way we would use our, our mags and uh, all sorts of things, you know, all sorts of things uh, which we changed. And... Uh, I had a lot of fun. I, I do not regret my years in the police. I, I had good times. Um, I do not regret anything I've done. I know there are people who committed crimes. Uh, even during the war, people that go across what is the lines of decency and the, the rules of war, which, by the way, the police were never subjected to. We're not a signature to the Geneva Convention. You could see it in our ammo. But at the same time, we were subjected to the laws, and the laws were actually even more strict. But as I say to people, all these disgusting liberals who always have something to say about us, this was not policy. It was not policy for the South African Army, the Defense Force, or the police to go and commit war crimes. In fact, we bent backwards not to do so. And uh, where people stepped out of line, there were thorough investigations. And these people were mostly locked up. That is history. You can argue with me, but that's what happened. Yes, of course, a lot of people started doing things they should not have done and... Uh, well, that's on there. That's not on me. It wasn't me. I didn't do that. So, you know, as the years went on, I uh, I got married, and uh, we didn't work out after five and a half years. We called it quits. It's fine. I have no hatred to word to word serving. In in the early two thousands, I uh, I met my first late wife. She was an agent for the. DGSE, in other words, the French security uh, people, external people. Very interesting how we met. It's described a fictional way in one of the books, I think, I think Fox wrote. <clears throat> Basically came down that I was captured with a false passport and she was an interrogation officer. <laughs> and, uh, may I say it was love at the first interrogation, even although we couldn't show it, man. But um, but they kept me for, for quite a few days. It's a usual treatment, you know, but of um, Brooklex, um to make you uh, uncomfortable. You have no clothes. It's flipping cold. It's um, lots of shouting, lots of sudden uh, shouting in Arabic because apparently I look like somebody we were looking for. And I do look like that guy. I have to tell you, I actually asked my mom about it. 
she 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 was not amused. She was not amused, man. She 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 got actually very angry about the idea that could have a secret brother. <laughs> Um, but anyway, uh, after about three, four days, I can't really remember because we keep you awake and after three and a half days, you, you change, your mind change, your mind start going, I don't care how good your training is and how it's was extensive. Uh, at the end of the day, they're probably going to break you. It's a matter of timing. You release information slowly, but I release nothing, I'm proud to say, and I did move back as much as I could. In fact, I'm one of the few people who got expelled from Britain twice, once for spitting on Lord Kitchener's I want you. Um, Posters there at the War Museum, fantastic place here in London. And then uh, also I uh, was in a bit of a first fight in Buckingham Palace, but that's another story I can't really tell online. But we won the fight, I just want to say we won that fight. Um, but it caused immense trouble in a nice way, because I had to report to the president afterwards. And uh, Anyway, so uh, so after about three, four days, I said to Lotto, her name was Lotto, I said, uh, what are you looking for? And she showed me a picture. And I said, well, you know, this guy, yeah, he looks like me, but it's not me. But tell me, um, uh, uh, what's his nationality? He says, no, he's Armenian. I don't even know there's a place called Armenia, to be honest. And I said, well, uh, is he Muslim? I mean, are you, this is the early 2000s, you know, the Muslim war was still very much going on. It still is, it's just not in the newspapers, especially in sub saharan Africa. Let me tell you, all the others kind of break loose. Um, Rita Jim, they booked you. Well, man, it will open a world for you which you didn't know exist. And uh, <laughs> he said, Yes, he's, he's a Muslim. I said, Well, I can, I can show you I'm not a Muslim. He says, How are you going to do that? I said, Well, I, so I flashed, man. I flashed. I wasn't, I wasn't caught, you know, I'm not circumcised. So she had to admit, I, I cannot be uh, that guy. And so she had to make up. And part of the making up process there was to show me we could party. Which uh, <laughs> it was a very nice couple of days, and a week later we were engaged, and uh, a year later she was dead, killed in uh, operation. It's 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 not a it's not a fun world. It's not James Bond. Let me tell you, that world will cost you dearly. If somebody ever asks you to go there, you know the usual things. Or even the, you know the president's ear is on this, the prime minister will fuck it. So excuse my language, but. You don't do that. Walk away. It, it's not worth it. Anyway, I wrote about it. I think in Coat and Fox wrote, I wrote about how we how we met. Change the names, of course. So, you know, we had to protect people. You know, we live in times where people want to sue people without reason. Of course, I'm a attorney myself, or I used to be one. I'll just fight back. Uh, but anyway, a few years later, I met Melissa. And then Melissa passed. All the organs started packing up. Uh, what I can tell you is it was a very sad time in my life. That's when I started writing those George M. Jones books. I wrote, in fact, one book every month, 400 pages, for 48 months. If anybody says to you it takes many years to write a book, well, it might be for you. But I write a book in three weeks. It's quick. And I just do it. Since I have a talent for it, I praise the Lord. So then let's get back to legacy. So how did legacy start? So now I met this new woman in my life called Rebecca. Or Rivka, she, she's a Jewish name. Wonderful woman, successful businesswoman, great, great person, great personality. A little bit of a liberal type of EP, you know, totally not me. I'm very conservative. And uh, she bought Swiss and she bought um, American, the American dad, Swiss mom. So we got married in South Africa in about, I think, 2019. And we met in 2018. And um, well, you know, at our age, in our middle 50s, early 50s, you, you know, you know if something's going to work or not. I was a widow, she was a widow for all intents and purposes. And so we quickly knew, man, this is going to work. At our age, we don't have to worry about uh, the parents or, uh, you know, new children coming or things like that. That's not going to happen. Uh, but of course, and I'm grateful to say we had the blessing of our children out of a previous marriage when our grown up people. And so we, so we got married and I moved to Switzerland and I say, honestly, I even made a video of this. I hated Switzerland and I hate Swiss people and I hate the swine land. I just have no other word for them. I just can't stand those people. They're the most arrogant pieces of things you can imagine. But that isn't what bothered me. I think we also are arrogant, the colonials. colonials. But um, uh, they treated me very badly. They treated me completely different than they would have treated a guy, say, from New Zealand. It's in my video, which I made. You can go and look at it. It's absolutely shocking what 
Oh, we are we three people? We have no sense of um, of of dignity. We have no no such thing. No no sense of fairness. Whatever. We treat you like you were an African who's yet to steal their money. And of course, I was reacting to that. And and it's also impossible in, in Switzerland actually to find a job unless you can speak French. In the part where we were, it's very hard. It's almost impossible. So I was sitting at home and getting quite quite frustrated with life. By this time, I was out of a counter-terrorism going for at least 10 years or 9 years or something. So I wasn't involved anymore, but I can tell you I saw quite a few of these people we were hunting in Africa, walking around in the streets of Lausanne. So I'm predicting a nice, very nice jihadi attack in Switzerland in the coming coming years, and I would be applauding on this side. I would definitely not warn them. I will not lift one finger to help them. No, I won't. They can feel the pain. It will do them good. And uh, I was sitting there, and I thought to myself, man, what am I doing in this country? I actually even asked the Lord, because I'm a deeply religious man. And so I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what am I doing here? Surely you could not have brought me to this country just to to be so frustrated like this, and, and just to sit around and being a housewife? Surely not. I mean, surely I, 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 uh, I don't understand what's happening here. You'll have to open my eyes. And so that night I had like a dream. And the vision, even a dream. I mean, I, I don't know. And he just said to me, "Create a YouTube channel and go and speak to the army." And I said, "Lord, I'm not disrespectful, but I wish to remind you that I'm from the police, and the army and the police don't really, really like each other that much. To be honest, we, we, there's a bit of a misunderstanding between us since we were born. Um, we think we're too rigid, and they think we slog hot, but we had the most kills." Why is that? Why did Kufuid that 74% of all the kills in the Wombolot? Think about it. I know why. It's in my books. But anyway, I, I said, Lord, I, I, I just don't know why. I, but I'll tell you what, Lord, let me dream tonight again of, of this, and then perhaps I'll think about it. But I'm quite excited, you know, making notes. I don't want to forget about this idea. Because I have quick internet, I have a laptop, and I have time. And so... Uh, so that night, I, I dreamed the same thing again, but it said, call it legacy conversations, not legacy uh, interviews, like the word's original name. Because a conversation and an interview and an interrogation is three different things. So I think of legacy conversations more like a, like a gesprek, you know, like a conversation over a barbecue fire. Uh, that's, that's the type of thing I want to get, even though we do have more formal ones as well, where we talk about more uh, documentary type of styles. But... Basically, it's all about the man. I want to know who you, who's your parents, how did you end up in the army? Tell me about your experiences, man. And then, then that, that's how we go along. So I said on the third night, I said, uh, Lord, okay, there's, there's this thing in the Bible about the sheepskin, uh, having dew on it and, it and not having dew on it. It was a sign. May I ask you, Lord, before I start this venture, um, let me not dream of this, but please let me not forget about it. Man, I made about... 10 different notes which I put on my computers and my diary. Uh, if I could have put one on my forehead, I would have done that too. Just not to forget, because I was excited. I knew uh, this was something. That night I slept well, which is strange for me, because I never sleep well. I always have, you know, flashbacks, nightmares, that type of thing. And so, um, <laughs> the next day I called my mate, Esvia Fori, one Ricky, who was also on Fighting Me, and I said, Esvia, we want to write your book anyway. I tell you what we do, mate. We make a series of, of, of uh, episodes, and then we take that as the base of your book, the skeleton, and we write it from there. Of course, we wrote the book, and it became a top seller. Uh, it's a fantastic book, really good book to read. Some people were very disgusted with the way he described the Rhodesian uh, Special Air Service. I think it was taken out of, totally out of context. Um, mostly South Africans don't dislike the Rhodesian Army, and they for he certainly don't. So I don't know where most people came from. Uh, but anyway... So we made that, and I called my former commander, Colonel Potkiter, who was a dreadful man when he was younger. Man, he would look at you like this and would definitely step back two yards because if he if he really thought you were not listening, he would definitely just attack you. A fantastic policeman, best policeman I've ever seen in my life. And we made an episode as well, and the next time it just kicked off and people started coming and coming and coming, and now we have about 640 or something uh, videos. In fact, we have enough videos to, if I stop recording today, I will still have enough videos coming out till the end of June. We're almost always about two, three months ahead. That's why even if you record today with me, 
you will not come out until two, three months down the line. Uh, and I'm not alone at Legacy. We have other presenters there as well, six other guys and women, all of them contributing, all of them from different backgrounds. It seems the SAF has taken over. There's most of, of them are from SAF. I'm the only policeman. And uh, one's from uh, 6 one Mech. And the other three girls, either have intelligence background or military intelligence, or or uh, you know, one civilian is like a like a pastoral psychologist or something something like that. But they do fantastic work. And so we know at the stage where we we only have about four rules on legacy. The first thing is we we don't discuss politics. Why? Because I know from the last count about twenty seven different intelligence agencies are watching us. How do I know that when I've got mates in those places? They tell me. I also know about former Rhodesians actually was having a good life here in Thailand because I have to go to the British and US embassies to translate whatever is uh, said on legacy in Afrikaans. They have to translate and then they get the booze and the bribe for free. And I don't know what else. So, so that's important. Um, I know we're making a difference because I can see the reaction from the liberals. I also watch, there's always two or three people who are always down everything. Um, I don't care about views. Let me be right up, up, up front here. Yeah, I really don't give a whatever about views. For me, it is totally about the history, man. Just get the history out there. And it is very good for the men and women to speak. No one else wanted to listen to them. Now we're listening to them. 99% very supportive. Um, but we don't talk, discuss politics. We don't discuss COVID. It's not my problem whether you took a poison injection, as some people call it or not. I don't care. It's between you and your doctor. So we don't get involved in that. And then uh, I'm not interested in any secrets or, or, or war crimes. As I say again, this was not policy. I don't want to know about it. I don't want people to get locked up for something they said at Legacy, but even though you will you will suffer in court, we use the Legacy videos as evidence because guys are not speaking under oath. So it means nothing. In court, this means nothing. And he can always say there was someone holding a gun against his head in the background. That was dying But we stay away from that type of thing, uh, simply for reasons I don't want to give the liberals. I consider them to be the enemy uh, to any type of, um, of, of of weapons against us. We had enough problems in life as it is. And then lastly, we, we don't use the Lord's name in vain at all. Not even as a joke. We use the Lord's name, I ban the video. And uh, very serious about it. We have a chaplain's corner which comes out once a week. <coughs> Our chaplain is going along the rebel He was a police member. He was also the first aide of the railway police special task force, trained in Israel. Fantastic man. And now he runs a very big company and he's uh, giving us a message of hope every week. I also have people uh, talking about their uh, experiences. You know, everybody, I'm sure, is the. Uh, there's an experience where God was close to him during the war years and afterwards, for me, the afterwards were a lot worse than the war years. The war years were actually fun to me. Trying to make a damn living, living in, in Silly Street was, was much tougher than anything else, in my opinion. Uh, so so we don't play the fool when the Lord's name is is, is, is involved and I have zero tolerance with, with, with uh, nasty comments. That's the other thing about legacy. If a guy don't behave, if he makes a snotty comment, if he makes like... Uh, you know, it's what I consider to be an insulting question, I just ban it. Now, people might say to me, what about freedom of speech, man? If you think there's freedom of speech in this world, I've got a bridge to sell you in San Francisco, cheap, go, go cheap. It's bloody nonsense. There is no such thing as freedom of speech, especially not on YouTube and especially not on social media. They all report to the various governments and every word you say they will be used against you in some time in the future. In fact, it is being used. I can tell you, if you find people on the internet who just sprouts their mouth off, who just shoot their mouth off, they say these most interesting things and everybody is just cheering them on. Let me tell you, they're probably a fake, they're probably a red flag type of thing. They probably being being put there by intelligence agencies and then they see who's commenting what and then they bought your file. Why do I know this? Well, <laughs> I know from a couple of hundreds of such, uh, such channels which, which we used to run. So be very careful what you say on, on legacy. If you make a comment I don't like, I don't even argue. I never get into an argument online. I get rid of you. Um, I do this because I feel that the guy who's talking here, our guest, is really taking a chance, if you think about it. He's, he's putting his own life out there. And he needs to be protected 
in the sense that he can't protect himself. He's not there to, to say, but hey, man, you can't say that. That's not the truth. That's not what I said. You know, so we just hammer these guys. We get rid of them, and guess what? It's working. It's working. I've got a lot of people who say to me, because we're very grateful for that. We feel we can talk here, and we know it's a safe place for us. We know that we've been taken care of, and we know that uh, uh, you won't tolerate any nonsense, and I won't. Even if a guy writes and he puts in free exclamation marks or free question marks, or he writes in bold, which in social media means you're shouting, bye, bye. You will not be shouting to me at my face. There will be consequences if you do it. My nickname was Try Me. Probier me, try me, try me. See what will happen. I guarantee you something is going to happen. So I just feel it's the same here, man. I mean, people feel very comfortable behind their little keyboards. They jump to conclusions. They don't even watch the entire video. And you just get rid of them and you have peace and it works well. And that's legacy. And yeah, lastly, we left Switzerland about two years ago and we came to Phuket, Thailand, Patong Beach. Because Rebecca's dad uh, left her uh, a guest house. It's not a big one, about 15 rooms, four stories, uh, big restaurant, things like that. It's about 700 yards away from Patong Beach. And uh, that's where we now. And we're rebuilding this place, renovating it. And then probably we will sell it and move on. I have an idea of getting a Samuel 50 and uh, converting it with a bit of a caravan in the back and just travel around a bit, or perhaps we will settle somewhere else, anywhere except in a NATO country, and uh, we'll be good. And so I want to invite all of you, please, if you have uh, served uh, afterwards in the SADF or in the SA police, or you have a story about your time in South Africa, man, come and tell us. I mean, we would really welcome you here. Uh, also, I'm looking for people to tell me about the Viscount uh, shootdowns. Uh, why? Because I need the people to, to, to remember this, to know about it, because it almost happened again, I think, in Nairobi, when uh, some people launched that LO aircraft that they could def uh, defeat electronically the missiles, and then they stopped flying to Kenya for quite a while. And, of course, we knew about 9-11. Uh, it happened, the test run actually happened uh, before in North Africa. Uh, everything new is from Africa, isn't it? <laughs> actually no and then, then they landed at Marseille and the French Special Forces stormed the aircraft uh, that aircraft was supposed I think it's 98 and about there was supposed to fly into either the Eiffel Tower or the French Presidency uh, so all of these things are coming together and there's a lot of um, really a lot of things happening with jihadis in, in sub saharan Africa a lot of things and uh, Zimbabwe is playing a major role in that it's in my books in the GMJ books we will expose them a bit uh, but at the end of the day, guys, the Rhodesians are welcome here. Please don't um, don't hesitate. If you feel you want to, to tell your story, uh, come and talk to me. My uh, my links are here. It's in the description as well as uh, flashing on the screen. Uh, just contact me and we will accommodate you as, as soon as we can. So as we say at Legacy, we always end like this, or I do anyway. Um, God bless. God bless until we, we meet again.